Resilience. The capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. Toughness. I was trying to figure out the best way to talk to you guys about resilience. And I decided that telling a few stories from my past is probably the best approach. I wanted to go through some of the triumphs, some of the tribulations, and I hope that through this you see how the tribulations and some of those things you don't quite get are part of the process to getting you to where you need to go. This is a photo of when I was 15 years old. So I decided to take a, a year and I traveled to India as a Rotary Youth Exchange student. As you can imagine, at 15 years old, you can see the smile, you know, I was excited, my mom was terrified. <laughs> I remember getting on the plane and there was this other student from Big Harbor who was going and we left the gate, we got onto the plane and I remember just breaking down the tears, bawling, being like, what did I just do? <laughs> and, you know, and so we, we got on the plane, we get over there, and we'll go to the next one. That year changed me in so many different ways, I can't, I can't describe it, it's a whole story in itself. But this is one of the biggest moments of that year. I got pulled into this group that did a 50-hour non-stop aerobics event for, to set a world record for the Olympic Books of World Records. For those who don't know, India is super big into world records in these little communities. Uh, so the guy that I met in Surat, um, which is in Gujarat State, he had set like 17 different world records, so he'd done all these different random ones. And he'd done the aerobics one with these groups of people where they did 24 and then 32, 36. And the year I did it was India's 50th year of independence from Britain, so it was in 1997. And there were 16 of us that he talked into doing this. So this was one of those, I'd never done anything more than like three hours at a time. And to make that jump from three hours to 50 hours, uh, so two days, two hours, was just unbelievable. So we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Now I, I want to talk to you about what it takes to do ultra endurance sports or where I feel like the major things for resilience are. And as a teacher, you usually have a list of three. So the, the three things that for me really dictate a lot of how that, that plays out is having a spirituality. So having a connection to faith, a connection to the community, a connection to the world, some, something that grounds you. The second one is community, the people we engage with in our community, the people that we have as crew, the people that we train with. Um, and the third one is, and this was one of the things that pushed me to that next level of, uh, of sports and, and the, the level of stuff that I was doing, is that connection to something outside of yourself. So once you're doing something for something bigger than yourself, it's, it's incredible where the world takes you and where that journey is. So it's spirituality, community, and a higher purpose. This, this run, I usually don't get to talk about this much anymore. Uh, when I was in college, my, one of my psychology professors was an endurance um, runner, one of the early guys back in the 80s. And he saw me running all the time to cut weight for wrestling. So he kept trying to get me to go, to go running with him. And he was one of those tall, lanky, um, you know, kind of long-haired, hippie-looking guys. And I was like, I'm not gonna run with you. And uh, so I slowly started running with them and running with them. And uh, you know, we started at like three miles, and then six, and then 10, and then 14. Um, and I remember our first 14 mile run around this lake and it was just brutal. And I swore I would never go running with him again. And two weeks later I went again. Um, and I remember going into his office and on the wall there was these photos. And it was these, it was these people, these men and women with the biggest smiles you'd ever seen. And I was like, I was like, Mark, what, what is that? And he's like, that's the finish of the Lead Belt 100. We finish and, and you just see them exuding this joy. Um, and I was like, oh, I, I could see kind of why you do that. I never want to do it myself. And, uh, you know, and then as life happens, a few years later, um, you know, I, a lot of different things happened. And then I, I was in this middle of an adventure uh, doing a cross country bike trip. And it was in the middle of that, I was like, I think there's something about this ultra stuff that I'm wired to do, and it was in that moment that I decided to train for this race. So I trained for three years for this race, the Level 100, devoted a ton of my money, my fi like my finances, my time. Um, I was staying here in Port Angeles during that, and when I went to the race, I ended up DNFing, so did not finish, about halfway through it. So I missed the time cutoff by 14 minutes, they pull off your wristband, you can't go any further. And when you do that, like, imagine how that feels. 
So you train for something for three years, and then you get there and you, you don't finish. Like, I had a person come from a different state to pace me the last 20 miles of it. He didn't even get to run with me. And I, I remember this whole flood of emotions. Uh, like, the, the first one there was actually, oh my goodness, thank, thank goodness I don't have to go up and over that stupid mountain again and finish this thing. So this, this rush of relief. And then there was like, how do I talk to my friends about this? What does this mean for my life? Like, all those questions. And I found, two years later, I, I found the things that I messed up on, things I could fix, things that I could train better for, and I finished my second attempt. So this was a five-year journey to this. And I finished, the time cutoff is 30 hours, so I did it in 29 hours, 24 minutes, and 38 seconds. <laughs> and that leads me into another race. So um, this race, uh, and the jersey I'm wearing. So probably the, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, um, more because of the time cutoff, was the solo race across America. So race across America, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a 3,000 mile, 12 day, nonstop race. So you start in Oceanside, California, you have to bike 3,000 miles, and you end in Annapolis, Maryland. And I, I remember uh, before the race, I was sharing with my Rotary Club, and I told them exactly what I just told you. And then one of my friends, Brady Connell, got up and he was like, I don't think you guys realize what Rob's about to do. And he's like, I don't think you realize the, the struggle he's going into. And he started breaking it down. And in the middle of that, I, could re I, I was aware of like, oh, there was only about 10% of the people in that room who even got what I was going to do. The rest of them like, oh, he's doing a cross-country trip. He's going on this journey. Um, and as I was thinking about that, preparing for this, a lot of us in our lives, people don't know the things that we're going through. People don't know the, you know, the losses we've had in our life. People don't know, some of us have, you know, some of us have just lost loved ones in our lives. Some of us are going through financial struggles. Some of us have had to leave our homes and go other places. You know, some of us are, you know, have these health issues that are unseen that nobody knows about. And I, I realized that you know, and I hope you see this, and as I'm going through the rest of these slides, there, there is so much within these journeys and these adventures that is unseen and that people just don't, don't get. But it's in the midst of leaning into those and pressing through them that we get to the other sides of them. And a lot of times that journey has a lot of road bumps. It has a lot of like, oh, I didn't quite make it, I need to recover. Oh, I didn't quite make it, I need to shift to something else. So I'll share a little bit more of this one, we'll go to the next slide. Um, actually, that, this photo, there's one other thing about this I, I don't share with very many people. So this, when I talk about community, these are four of my crew. Kyle Downs, he's actually in here. Listen, thank you for coming. Um, this is a wonderful photo. It's one of my favorite shows kind of the community. It's also one that we got a one hour time penalty because the runners are on the road. Um, <laughs> so, so in the middle of the race, I'm like, that's okay, we just keep going. But uh, I, because things turned out well, I love this photo and how it is. Also, Gay Hunter, she's another local. Um, you know, just love having friends and family and people surround me on, on these events. So the next slide. Um, the third part where I was talking about doing this for, for things bigger than yourself. Um, for those of you who don't know her, this is Jody Allman, she's local. Uh, her daughter, Christina Allman, um, before this was diagnosed with brain cancer. And Christina was one of those most joyful, giving, just faith-filled souls you'd ever know. And you know, and, and having the ability to raise money for brain cancer research and have her mom along on this journey was so powerful and driving it, it changed the way that I race. It changed the it, it made me open up to like, oh. When I connect to something bigger than myself, I can do things I never thought I could do. Um, so this just shows that joy in the midst of raising money for something, a purpose bigger than yourself. Let me go to the next slide. And this shows some of the hardship. <laughs> so this is my, my niece Madison, and this is one of those days, probably about eight days into it. Um, over the race, you're, you're on the road for 20, you're on the road for 12 days, I slept uh, less than 20 hours. I'm sleeping about you know, an hour to a night. And this is just one of those taking a 10 minute break, icing my feet, knowing I gotta get back on, trying to figure out how to keep going. 
and you know but just that support and that care from the, the crew around you how meaningful that is you can go to the next slide and here's the finish so we had a crew of 14 people uh, including madison and uh the thing about the thing about this race i don't think you can do it without the support and we finished with uh two hours and 57 minutes to spare uh, this one is a race that we did the following year uh, the Badwater 146. So it was from the lowest point of Death Valley up to the, the summit. I'm just showing this to, to lead up to the, the race that I'm talking about in a minute, so we can go to the next slide. Um, the swim. So a lot of you guys are, are aware of this one. So in 2019, so I, I did Race Across America and I leaned into the Badwater race, which is the world's toughest uh, foot race. There's no one for that. And then I was trying. I was getting ready to do a fundraiser, and I found one that's the world's toughest ultra endurance triathlon. Um, so after doing Badwater, I, I was like, "Oh, I need to learn how to swim better." And, but the problem is, I'm not a natural swimmer. I'm not a good swimmer. Um, I'm not comfortable in the water, but I am an endurance swimmer. I can keep going. And so, as I was getting ready for this, I was like, "Well, I need to train for this." So I spent an entire year jumping into the sport that I didn't really know much about. Um, and at the end of that training year, I decided to swim from, because I'd, I'd noticed that there were these two Canadian swimmers that swam from Canada to Port Angeles. And I was like, I could do that. So I swam from Dungeness to the shoreline, well, to the, the harbor in Victoria. So I was, I was in the water for 17 hours, uh, covered over 30 mi 31 miles with the, uh, with the tide. And the last three hours, we were in the harbor over there, didn't hit shoreline. So I spent three hours getting kicked around in the currents. Uh, we made one final last ditch effort, and the boat said I was within 670 feet of the shoreline when they pulled me out at 11 o'clock at night. Um, so this is one of those, I, I did swim to the, the not the shore, but you know, um, to the harbor of Victoria, Canada. And the next one. Beyond the Ultra is the Uber, the race unlike any other surpassing the extreme into the realm of the impossible. This is the Uberman, 21 miles from Santa Catalina Island to Palos Verdes, equivalent to swimming the English Channel, 400 miles from the coast deep into the heart of the California desert at Badwater Basin, the lowest point in the U.S. 135 miles across Death Valley, and finally, finishing at Mount Whitney Portal, 8,360 feet above sea level, to be crowned this year's Uberman. All right, so this is the race that we trained for, for in 2020. Go to the next slide. Um, and if you guys all remember what happened in 2020, trying to, trying to train through that, trying to get the crew together. Um, and, but I, you know, as I was, as I'd heard about this, I knew that I'd done, like I had the biking background and I'd done the bad water race. So this one, we, you know, it's a 21 mile swim. And so I, I felt comfortable, even though I didn't make it to the Victoria shoreline, um, feeling comfortable knowing that I could be in the water that long. The, the course for this one is 21 miles. So you start in Catalina and then go all the way to the uh, San Pedro. Can we get next slide? Beyond the Ultra is the Uber. Next slide. There we go. So here's me in the water, uh, swimming. So on this one, uh, what happened again was I, I swam. We started at night at 9 o'clock, swam through the night, and um, I was in the water for 19 hours. I was about four miles off the coastline. And the last three hours I was in the water, I had moved forward less than a mile. So we had this current coming at me, and so it was, it was one of those knowing that I'd, I'd been in the water that long, didn't know how my, my mind and body would act, so we ended up pulling me from the water with four, left, four, four miles left. And then next slide. So, you know, as is my habit, I got a good night's sleep and then trekked right onto the next stage of it. So here's, here's me on the bike the next morning, kind of resetting, um, you know, now on the bike ride, you know, the next. And then the run. So the, the run part of it, I feel like Uberman, each section was its own race because each one's like a monster. 
So the, the swim, the hard part was I didn't finish it. I only made it uh, 17 miles out of the 21. The bike, I ended up falling asleep the second day, so I got in a crash. Um, and then I got back on my bike, finished it out about 2 a.m. And then on the run, I uh, sprained my ankle you know, during the bike crash, so I didn't even know if I could make it across the desert. So I started there, and thankfully it was a side sprain, so it didn't affect me at all. Hiking, so I was able to hike. And then this is right before I uh, kind of overheated. So I was about 100 and some miles into it, and all of a sudden I just, I was sweating, I couldn't, I, I stopped sweating, I couldn't control my, I just felt kind of woozy. And so I alerted my crew to my, you know, to being distressed. And thankfully, one of the local guys brought an RV. So we went in there, um, I turned on the cold shower, I packed myself in ice, and I laid there for about two hours. Which thankfully on this race, there's no time limit. So if you need to recover, you can do that. And after about two hours, I, you know, kind of got back to normal. And then it was moving into the evening, so I was able to go out, the temperature dropped. So I was able to finish the run. Let me go to the next slide. And in the middle of the run, I reached out to the, the race director and asked him if I finish this and then get up to the Mount Whitney portal and then go right back to where I pulled out of the water, will you consider it an official finish? Uh, so at four in the morning, I got dropped off and then swam the, the four miles, it took me five hours. And uh, my, my friend here, Gareth on the right, he got in the water with me and swam every stroke of it with me. He hadn't, been in the, he hadn't swam in years. And so this is a shot at the end with Gareth who swam me in, and then my son Hudson, Kalea, my wife, um, officially making me the seventh person ever to finish Uberman. Uh, so the race. And then next slide. All right, so I'll finish on this story and then leave you with a couple thoughts. Um, so this last summer, I did this race, it's called the Starvation uh, Extreme Triathlon. And this is Gay Hunter again, she's a local runner and then my family. Um, so we went out there, the swim went great, it's an all dark swim, we started at 5 a.m. And then the bike did great for the first 86 miles and then there's this hill, you start at like 7,000 feet up to 9,700 and had three and a half hours to do it and didn't make the time cut off. So I missed it by about half an hour. And it's one of those on these races, you, my goal is you, you start them, you go as far as you can so you don't make a time cut off or you're injured. And in this one, it was like, oh yeah, this is the race where there's a time cut off. So I called it a day. And you know, and this is one of those like, okay, um, how do you deal with that? How do you process with that? And so going into this year, as I was thinking about it, I was like, I kind of want to go back and have a redemption year where there's so many of the swims that I didn't finish. And I was like, I'm gonna do that on a kayak and kind of do these paths on this kayak. And the thought I wanna leave you with is on the, the swim over to Victoria. I remember when getting out of the water, it's 11 at night, we didn't have the, the right lights. And I remember talking to my crew like, like, are you guys okay? Like, is there any chance that we can get to the shoreline within the next two to four hours? And they were like, no, I, I don't know. Like, we don't know with that. And so I was like, are you guys okay if I get out of water? Um, and they were like, yeah, you know, it's, I think that's the best move at this point. And I remember reaching up and having my friend Jack Church, who was one of the boat drivers, pull me out. And I remember thinking like afterwards, I wanna be that type of person that can pull people out of the water. I'm gonna be the type of person that when people are in distress, we can help them. We can help them as people, we can help them as communities. And also as we're out there in the thick of these adventures, build this community around us so that if you're that person out there, you have people to pull you out of the water. So whichever situation you're in, if you're the front person or if you're pulling people out, be that person who gives resilience to those around you. Thank you.